my name is Jovial, and today I would like to talk about my Aero Sudoku, Syzygy, uh, that was recently covered on the channel. If you've not watched the video or solved it yourself, please do so before watching this video. That was your spoiler warning. I want to quick fast thank Simon and Mark for giving me the opportunity to make this video for you all, and I hope to spread some valuable insight into what exactly goes on behind setting a puzzle. So this puzzle actually began on February 22nd with a text from Kodak, of all things. Uh, we were bouncing some ideas off of one another, and Kodak presented to me a really fascinating idea for an Aero Sudoku. Now, the final puzzle is not the idea Kodak put in front of me, and that's an important thing in setting, I think. Sometimes you sit down with a goal, and the goal changes over time as you create, which is precisely what happened here. For me, setting a puzzle has five parts. Part one is the concept, or essentially the end goal. Part two is the approach. Part three is the break-in. Part four is the mid-solve. And part five is the finale. There's also an overarching thing that's extremely important, which I will talk about at the end of this video, but you may be able to pick up on it throughout. Also, please keep in mind that everyone approaches puzzle setting differently. This is what works for me and what I like to do and might not be what works for you. And that's okay, we all have different brains. What I'm sharing here are just my opinions and the way I view things when it comes to puzzles. If you disagree with me, I genuinely think that's great. Find what works for you. As far as puzzle creating software and tools, I use either Swaroop's Fork of Penpa or Eric Fox's tool, fpuzzles.com, which is where I set this puzzle and it's the website that's in front of me right now. Both resources are linked in the Discord server and the people there are happy to help you learn how to use them. So for part one, the concept I had was the idea Codex sent me. Sometimes a concept can be something as vague as a really good disjoint group thermo sudoku, or as specific as a palindrome puzzle that forces the entire grid to be colored before you can make any progress. It takes experience to know whether or not your concept is a good one from the start. A puzzle can only be as good as its concept. So armed with Codex concept, I sat down and the first thing I did was start toying with some shapes. This is the beginning of part two, the approach. I think the approach, personally, is the most important of all five parts, believe it or not. It's the time where you just mess around and draw some shapes or place some digits, sometimes for many hours until you find something you like. The first thing I found that had promise was this. Now, if you've seen Simon's video, which I suspect you have, you won't be able to really recognize these shapes. Uh, the idea was simply that these four arrow cells uh, have to sum up to at least 10, because the minimum of four different digits in a Sudoku is 10. Therefore, these two circles have to sum up to at least 10. Uh, my next idea was the following. So I wanted to expand on those minimum sums of 10. Um, by thinking about how they might interact with this circle in row seven, column three. Uh, each two cell arrow, uh, these, has to have at least one digit under five. Some of them might have digits over five, but that's not mandatory. Uh, if there were any high digits along these arrows, then they would all see this circle. I stared at this grid for a few hours and couldn't really find anything uh, I really liked about it. I continued to work on variations of this uh, for a few hours, hoping that I could get some sort of high-low thing working. Um, and the thing that I found with the most promise was this. So, um... <clears throat> Excuse me. Maybe those of you smarter than me can figure out a way to get this to work. But the idea was that all of these cells see the circle in the middle. Uh, these cells all see this one. And these cells all see this. Um, I couldn't really see anything here that was immediately striking me. I was really trying to do something here with you know, high-low coloring and, you know, trying to uh, minimize certain arrows and etc. And I just couldn't really see anything I liked about this. Um, also, 
as you can see, this grid is already very full and there's very little given information, um, or at least there's very little information that I have to use, um, which is usually a red flag. After a few days of toying with this idea and working on a couple other things in the background, I decided to completely scrap it. Um, Codex idea was still lingering in the back of my head, but nothing I'd created so far had really worked and I was getting kind of uh, disheartened with it. <clears throat> So after over a week of messing with uh, this idea and variations of it, I decided to scrap the entire grid and start from scratch. After some deliberation, I decided to start over all the way from part one again and give myself a new concept. Um, and thinking about it to myself, I realized that I wanted to make an arrow Sudoku using multi-arrow sums in certain sets. So for example, um, this would be a multi-arrow sum because these two cells have to sum up to at least 15, which means these two cells have to sum up to at least 15. Um, so that's what I mean by multi-arrow sums. Now, I toyed around with a couple more shapes, uh, remembering some of the ones I had from the previous grids, and eventually drew these. If you've seen the final puzzle and Simon Solve, which I suspect you have, then you already know that this idea ended up working out. When I drew these, I didn't know at the time that these two cells had to be different, or excuse me, had to be the same digits. Um, I just drew these because I liked the way they looked. I really liked the idea of forcing two high digits to appear in column one in the circles. And I really liked the minimum sum of 15 logic here. But it only took me a few minutes of staring at it to realize that these two cells had to be the same. Now, I learned it uh, from trialing all the options of what if it didn't, because I knew that this circle already had to go in this column in uh, box four. So it was forced into one of these three cells in box seven. Now, I, I just tried all the options of uh, it going on the arrow and figured out that it couldn't, but I wanted to find a more logical way uh, and a more easy to understand way. So I thought about it for a few more minutes and um, after a quick conversation with Totally Normal Cat, realized that um, you could express the arrow sums as, um, you know, if the circle was if the circle was on the other arrow, you could express this as one of the circles plus four different digits, so it's always too high. I was quite excited about this actually. I I really liked the deduction at this point, and I. Um, it was re I really liked it compared to everything else that I'd done before. So I think this is a good time to bring up a point that I think is essential in creating a puzzle, and that is patience with yourself and with the grid. When I am in part two, just drawing some shapes, I sometimes stare what I have, stare at what I have for multiple hours, um, trying to squeeze every last bit of logic I can get out of it. And this takes a lot of time and energy um, this is part of why I don't put pressure on myself to be really prolific with the amount of puzzles I put out. I simply want each one to be something I'm proud of, regardless of how long they take. So, to recap, we're over a week into setting the puzzle, and I've only got two arrows in the grid. <laughs> and I know that row 3, column 1 has to go into row 9, column 2. For the amount of time that I'd already put into the scrapped idea, it would be pretty easy to get frustrated here about the pure lack of things in the grid. I was, on the other hand, pretty ecstatic that I had anything at all that I liked. So like I do every time I get excited about a new idea, I sent it to a freight knot, <laughs> and I extended the question of the location of row 3 column 1 in box 7 as a puzzle for him to solve. He sent back an exploding head emoji and the phrase, I almost didn't believe you for a minute, <laughs> which means I was on the right track with something here. Uh, I sent the grid with Clover, or I sent the gr grid to Clover with the same question, and she asked if she could mess around with it. She soon sent me back this grid, saying that this forces row three column one to be eight or nine. Now I liked this deduction; it was quite nice, and I agreed with her on that. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it wasn't very me. It would be very well and good, and it would make a fine puzzle to leave this as a step in the break-in but I eventually decided against it because I simply just didn't love it. Uh, 
but I still had the knowledge that I could come back to this if I couldn't find anything that I liked more. So I removed the arrows and moved them to the center um, where I continued, where I continued uh, messing with them for a few more hours uh, over a period of a couple of days. I eventually uh, came across this configuration knowing that it forced this cell and this cell to be the same uh, using the exact same logic as down here. Uh, looking at this grid in hindsight is kind of fascinating because we all know what it eventually became. The core bones of the idea are there, but it's not very polished, it's not fleshed out. You'll also notice that there is no you know, 6, 7, 8, 9 quadruple anywhere, or really any alignment at all of digits. So I did some highlighting from here, uh, looking at every single place that this cloned cell sees. And I played with this a little bit and was trying to look for things I could do here with set maybe, even though I am not the biggest fan of really complicated sets. Um, but I eventually um, rearranged the arrows into this configuration. Uh, let's get rid of my highlighting. And as you know, this shape made it into the final grid. Um, now I didn't move the arrows around on purpose to create uh, the first three digits of a six, seven, eight, nine quadruple. That was not on purpose, but it sort of just happened. Um, while I was toying around, I stumbled into this and I realized it was too perfect to let go. Um, at this point, the deductions to get here were already pretty difficult. Um, so I wanted to reward the solver in some way for finding them. <clears throat> Excuse me. In my opinion, hard puzzles sh should reward the solver for thinking in the right ways, either by giving them digits or by giving them progress. Difficult, du difficult deductions should be telegraphed, uh, which means that the puzzle should naturally lead the solver into finding them, and the deductions should be rewarded. Throwing in a finned Franken swordfish with no indication that that is what the solver should find, and then a not and then not immediately rewarding them for finding it, is in my opinion bad practice. The solver should be rewarded for thinking in the right ways, giving them encouragement to continue solving the puzzle. Wouldn't it be really disheartening to find a really beautiful and very difficult piece of logic, and feel really proud of yourself for finding it, just to have it not give you anything? So keeping that in mind, I move the arrows back to the left side of the grid where I then added this three cell arrow to reward the solver with a 6789 quadruple. Now we've moved into part three a little bit. I was now 100% sure that I wanted these arrows in my final grid. Uh, I have a break in idea with a 6789 quad in row six but I still don't really have an idea of what to do with it yet. So this is kind of part 2.5. Uh, from here, I tried a lot of different things. I wanted to squeeze every little bit of logic I could out of these four arrows. Um, and I realized you know, pretty early on that these two cells have to have exactly one repeat between them, but I couldn't really get anything out of it for a few days. Um, so after a lot of failed grids that didn't do much, that I don't really want to share, mainly because I can't remember them, but also because I think they'd be a waste of time, uh, they didn't really give me anything. So I was starting to get a little bit frustrated, and I decided to take a few days off. Um, in those days off, I couldn't. the puzzle didn't really escape my mind. I was kind of thinking about it all the time. I went to bed that night and woke up in the middle of the night with a deduction in my head. So I actually got out of bed around 4.30 and added this arrow in the grid and knew that the repeated digit had to be three uh, because you have to be able to split it up to fit it on this arrow. Um, I was suddenly very, very excited. I felt like I had something special in my hands, but I wanted to make sure it was correct. So I triple checked it and then I sent it to a freight knot, and he sort of smiled and nodded. <laughs> I'm not sure if he fully understood at the time. 
And right about at this point, Totally Normal Cat actually published a, a really amazing Arrow Sudoku as well. Um, his puzzle's called Konami Code. And I took one look at it and thought that we'd found the same exact break-in idea completely independently of one another uh, based on the shapes of the arrows. And I was scared that we had the same idea and that he was the first to publish. And that was terrifying to me. <laughs> so I messaged him and asked him what his break-in was because I was scared I was going to have to scrap the whole puzzle. He messaged me his break-in, which, by the way, is stunning, but completely different, which was a huge relief. Uh, that puzzle, by the way, is really good, so I urge you to go all solve it. I then messaged him that I was working on a standard arrow as well, and that I thought we'd come up with the same idea independently. I asked if he wanted to hear my break-in. He agreed, so I explained it to him, and he said, Well, it's got one problem. It's actually way too clever, so you'll probably get no solves. This made me laugh, but it also made me worry. I'm not, a I'm not a person who makes puzzles to be hard. I have a bit of a reputation for making puzzles that aren't too difficult, so I worried a little bit about what the reaction to this puzzle might be. And I think this is a good time to bring up part four, the mid-solve, and with it, one of my biggest philosophies in setting, and a big reason why many recent puzzles bother me a bit. If your solve, post-break-in, is tedious and slow, you run the risk of sapping all of the enjoyment the solver gets out of the break-in and changing it directly into frustration at the puzzle for not giving you anything. The word difficult in this community can mistakenly be interpreted as synonymous with beautiful, so inexperienced setters sometimes make the, uh, sometimes make the mistake of setting for difficulty, hoping that it will be seen as beautiful. These puzzles often are simply tedious and frustrating. This is why Syzygy collapses fairly quickly after the difficult break-in. The logic remains interesting, but not brutally difficult. With all of this being said, once you've got a good break-in, it's often the case that you just stare at it and go, well, what now? It took a lot of trial and error uh, trying to find logic that I liked enough to keep in the puzzle. For about a week, actually, I kept creating new steps I didn't like, then scrapping them and starting back from these four arrows. It started to affect me mentally a bit, and the frustration was kind of getting to me, so I took a few days off. When I find myself getting frustrated at a, puzzle, at a puzzle I'm making, I take a break. Because I don't put time pressure on myself to create puzzles, I allow myself as much time and freedom with the process that I need. I think that's healthiest for me, and in the end it usually turns out okay. So in those days off, I did some solves from the Discord server, and asked for advice from some of my favorite setters and close friends, those being Kodak, Totally Normal Cat, and Afraid Not. Some of the things they told me gave me new insights into how I might be able to continue the puzzle. So the next shape I drew as a result was this one. And I'm going to put in the information we know at this point. Right, so the idea behind this shape was that it would force um, row one, column three, to contain a one or two, because um, we still need one and two in this uh, in box one, column three, and the arrow here must be at least five because um, because of box five, this being at least four, so one and two can't both go on the arrow, therefore the cell is one or two. So I liked this and realized to myself that I wanted to put it in the final puzzle. And the next thing I drew directly related to that was this. Now, as you know, this almost made it into the final puzzle, but this is another important thing in setting. So this is what's called a logical leap. This sometimes happens in setting where you think something is more forced than it actually is. Sometimes this can cause entire puzzles to be completely thrown out, which is a real shame, but it's not that uncommon. The idea here was that the circle in row two, column four, whoops, uh, has to be eight or nine because any smaller would force both one and two onto this arrow and one, and two, one or two has to go here. Unfortunately, with this, I falsely assumed that three and four are forced onto the arrow, but I completely um, didn't even see one, three, five as a composition that would be valid here because it is. 
Um, so I continued to trial grids out with this assumption and eventually decided to add these arrows, which did make it into the final puzzle. Um, I added these because I liked the idea of forcing all of the digits one, two, and three into the bottom four rows of the grid. Um, forcing this one to be four, five, and nine, and then immediately firing back into here and forcing this to be one, two, and six, three, nine. Um, I liked this deduction. Although it was a bit easy, I did like it. Um, so at this point, once I get to around this point, I actually uh, throw it into the F puzzle solver and uh, sort of confirm that it has any solutions whatsoever. Not that it's unique, of course it's, this is not unique, but I just want to confirm that it has any solutions. Um, so I'm going to do that right now. We're going to hit solve and we're going to wait for F puzzles. So sometimes when you're at this stage, you hit solve and wait for F puzzles to solve. Sometimes it runs out of time and uh, it can't solve your puzzle within the allotted time. Uh, sometimes the puzzle's already broken at this point, and you have to back up a few steps when that's the case. Uh, that can be really frustrating, but it luckily never happened in the creation of this puzzle. At this point, this puzzle still has thousands and thousands of solutions. Honestly, I was starting to get a little bit frustrated with this puzzle at this point, and in moving on to step five, the finale, I actually just started throwing in random arrows until I was presented with a unique solution. Uh, so this is what that grid looked like. This grid got through this break-in and then instantly collapsed with no struggle at all. Um, if you assumed 3 and 4 being forced up here. So I nearly actually posted this one before I really thought about it, I didn't like the way the solve finished. I didn't like the way the grid looked. And I didn't want the really special break-in that I had to be ruined by the end solve. So with that, I actually backed up uh, all the way to here again. Um with some words and a test of that previous version uh, by Totally Normal Cat, I realized my erroneous assumption that three and four were forced up here as they were not, and decided to re-add these arrows and instantly force its composition to be one, three, four, and for this to be eight. Whoops. Um, and then from here, I was still happy with what I had. Um, it was just a matter of uniqueness at this point. Um, these arrows already gave a lot of information, but I didn't like the way those previous one cell arrows were behaving. So I decided that I was not gonna allow the final grid to have any uh, one cell arrows. I felt as if the grid still had some untapped potential that I wasn't finding yet. Um, so at this point, this is the information we have. So the reason I added these pencil marks is because I wanted to point out something here that would plague the rest of my time setting this puzzle. And that would be this right here. So if you're not familiar with what a deadly pattern is, it is a pattern of cells that always has two solutions no matter what. So an example of a deadly pattern, uh, if you ignore all this information, let's say we just had this in our final grid. There would be no way to disambiguate that without adding another clue or another digit. Um, this would be sort of stuck as having two solutions always. Um, we have one of these here. Now, I knew that I was going to have to find a way to disambiguate it, and if I um, 
you know, added this arrow like the one I had in the first version, I was scared that the break-in was going to be bypassable because I was putting more information into the first three columns. So with that, I sent a version that did have this arrow to the constructor Gurgles and had him do a test solve, and he confirmed that my break-in was indeed bypassable. So I reluctantly added this arrow in box nine to fix the problem. Now, I, from the beginning of this puzzle, didn't want any arrows to cross each other. For me, that was just an aesthetic thing. Um, but I knew that for the sake of the solve and for the sake of the puzzle, I was going to have to have these arrows in box nine cross each other. So just going to have to make a little sacrifice there. With this, I actually struggled with a f uh, through a few more drafts, all of them unique. I probably had seven or eight different versions of this grid that all resolved uniquely, but I just didn't quite like any of them. Uh, so I asked Kodak for some advice, and he gave me a piece of advice that I'm never going to forget. He said that a good thing to focus on while finishing a puzzle is strong and weak cells. Where a strong cell is a cell that has a lot of candidates, maybe five, six, seven candidates, and a weak cell only has a few, maybe two or three. And he said that if you give information about the strong cells, the weak cells will just resolve themselves. I thanked him for providing me with a new perspective, and then I asked Totally Normal Cat for advice as well. As well. And he said that his favorite shape for uh, resolving a puzzle is this one, where at the beginning of the puzzle it can be as low as two, if these were both one, but by the end of the puzzle, this two cell arrow shape is often a useful tool. So I was sort of looking around for places to put one, and I found this. Now, I added this two cell arrow and realized that it had a really fun naked single on it, that this has to be three, no matter what. And I found that really fun and sort of uh, fun how that came out of nothing. Uh, or it felt like you didn't have any information and then you suddenly did. And I, I liked it, so I wanted it in the grid. Um, this grid, believe it or not, has 298 solutions. So we are very, very close to making this unique. Um, so by just hitting solve a bunch of times and scrolling through the solutions, uh, which I could demonstrate right here actually, if you look, you see that all of the different solutions are happening uh, in mostly in the bottom three rows of the grid. So I knew that the uh, final clues to disambiguate the grid needed to go in box eight because it was completely empty. So I actually just tried about a hundred different two cell arrows in box eight, hoping one of them would magically resolve the puzzle. Um, and none of them worked. So I decided that I probably needed to think about this a bit harder. And so I started thinking about what cells might be the weakest. Um, and I realized that row nine um, was probably the weakest out of all of these uh, three boxes. So the next arrow I tried was this one. And as you can see from running F puzzles on it, it ends up resolving the whole grid. Um, I now had a puzzle I was very confident in publishing. Uh, I was super happy with the way the break-in played out, and I liked that the logic uh, from the mid-solve to the end-solve is still interesting, but it's not too difficult. Um, so I sent it off to a couple of testers who confirmed that it was a good puzzle and the next day I published it on Logic Masters Germany, where it currently sits at 30 solves, a five-star difficulty, and a 100% approval rate, which is something I am very grateful for. So now that the puzzle has been solved, published, and covered on the channel, and now covered by me in this video, I'd like to explain why I made some of the decisions I made. So first of all, I said at the beginning of this video that there was something very important that I wanted to cover at the end. Uh, that thing is communication. Without input and encouragement from constructors like Codec, 
Totally Normal Cat, Gurkles, Clover, Afraid Not, Turganus, Shy, Kinlux, etc., this puzzle would not have ended up like it did. I feel incredibly grateful to have joined the Discord server, where I get to talk and laugh and collaborate with various brilliant people every day. I'm also aware that I mostly only covered the things that worked. There were days and hours of following trails that ended up going nowhere. And I feel like it's important to keep in mind that these sorts of puzzles don't happen overnight. I began working on it on February 22nd, 2021, and I published it on Logic Masters Germany on March 13th, 2021. The process of making a puzzle is a long one, often filled with frustration, but it's incredibly gratifying to publish it and hear from people who enjoy it. I think that's what makes it really worth it for me. I also have to thank Gurkles for the title to this puzzle. He's quite good at titles, so I asked him for one. I said that I wanted it to be something astronomy-related, as I thought the arrow coming from row 4, column 4, uh, looked like a bit like a spiral galaxy, which is actually something Simon pointed out in his solve. So with a few ideas thrown around, uh, he eventually threw out Syzygy, to which I instantly responded, perfect title, that's the one. It was perfect thematically, and the break-in was some form of Syzygy, with the 6789 quadruple appearing in row 6. So for those of you who want to improve your setting skills, I have one final piece of advice. If you want to set good puzzles, solve good puzzles. You will get ideas for what kinds of puzzles you like and don't like, and in that you'll find what kinds of puzzles you want to create. Once again, thank you so incredibly much to Simon and Mark for giving me the opportunity to make this video for you all. It's been an absolute pleasure to create and solve puzzles for the past few months. I look very much forward to continuing to publish puzzles and I hope you've learned something from this video. Thanks.